So this is a full process tutorial on how to use a home 3D scanner to scan in an object and fully prep the mesh and textures for use within a game. So the Creality comes with this nice little stand and I'm not using the phone adapter, I've plugged it directly into the PC. So I'm going to scan in this little carving. Now it is pretty small, especially on these thin edges around the feet, but I don't think that should be too much of a problem. So I have this cheap turntable from Amazon, link in the description and also a dirty old piece of blue tack. So I'm going to position this at the broken end of the tail. So as it spins round, we can see all sides of the crocodile and we don't really lose much at that bottom end of the tail. So we want to make sure that there is good even lighting on the direction that the camera is facing the object. It doesn't so much matter around the back of the object, but as long as there is no deep shadows uh, where the camera is pointing, we should get a neat even color texture. Now I've also found it a good idea to stack something up underneath the camera so that it's slightly facing down on the object to help give it more of a consistent point of reference as it spins. So let's open the Creality app and hit scan. So we want it set to normal, small, geometry, high quality, color, and we can set it to turntable or not. Now I've played around with this and the turntable does help it from drifting. So I'm gonna try it on turntable for now. So let's scan this. So you can see it's in a decent range there. It's in the center of the screen. It looks, everything looks okay. So let's just jump in and get a scan now. This is the tricky part because I don't want it detecting my finger as I try to press the turntable button. Okay, that was picking it up pretty well. Now this is the tricky bit to try and get around them hands. Will it, yep, yeah, it's done it. Now I'm really quite pleased with that. It is a very tricky process and sometimes you need to, to try out three or four different techniques before you get the scan that you want. Now, it's obviously not picking up the top side of his cheek here very well, so I am gonna lift the scan ferret up to try and get the little bits that I've missed. Um, but what I'm gonna do is wait for it to spin around a few times and make sure that's nice and bright green so it's got a really good idea of the shape of this. And then we'll try and uh, catch a little peak bit that we that we missed at the top there. So you can see it's actually not getting the underside of him as well. So what I need to do is lift the turntable up to point that kind of lower part at the camera. So as it spins around here, I want to attempt to do that. You know, you can see that there's, there's all sorts of bits of random geometry there caused by my hand being suddenly in shot, but we can clean that up later as long as it's not intersecting the actual model. That should be fine. Sometimes this is just kind of how it goes, unless you've got some sort of way of positioning the entire setup automatically, you're gonna have to stick your hand in there at some point. Okay, and then to get the top bit, I'm just gonna lift the scan up once it pops around. Okay, I think we have a decent scan there. So let's check that out. So we hit complete. We want to complete scanning. And then let's go to manual. So if you hover over this here, we can switch it to manual. And then while it's still open, we can turn this resolution right down to 0.2. Then we can hit optimize. Now this is a very small item, so I'm not expecting it to be uh, extreme fine detail, but we'll see what we get. Okay, so we don't want to convert the point cloud yet. We want to have a little look at it and clean it up a bit. So we'll hit no. And we can see it's gotten some fantastic detail on the on the surface of this. There is some edging here where it gets quite thin and it's um, gone a little bit messy, but nothing that will should show up in the final mesh. Could do with cleaning his toes up a bit here. We'll leave that for the mesh though. Uh, there's a hole here where we just couldn't quite get underneath, but I think that should be okay. So let's chop off the bottom bit that we don't need to do that. It can be very tricky, this software, but if we all shift and lasso select all the bottom, and you can see it's actually gotten rid of my hand data, so it is good at identifying stuff that wasn't always in the scan. So once that's selected, we can come down and hit delete. Oh, we've missed his eye as well. So uh, we'll, we'll see how this turns out. It might be that I need to just rescan this again and this time pay a little bit more attention to these areas because I think we can actually pick all this stuff up just fine. Look at how this 
goes anyway so we hover over again and don't hit it but let's go manual and we'll, I'm going to turn the faces up to because this is going straight into ZBrush so I'm going to just pump the faces up a little bit I don't think it needs any denoising we've got fill holes selected and closed mesh selected because them kind of things can be tricky to do in ZBrush so let's hit mesh and it's worth noting that this is a lot lot faster on your PC than phone but this process can take a considerable time up to maybe 20 minutes when you're doing it on your phone and it all depends on how many points you've actually scanned in so mesh complete let's not call them up yet let's have a look at the mesh so you can see it's tackled closing those holes really well so that's the back of the leg there we might even be able to just sculpt that detail back in and the tails close nicely there's no bridging across from any of the holes which is what could happen if you tried to close these in ZBrush you can get bridging that looks ugly so let's see what the color looks like okay so we've got the color details in here you can see even though it didn't capture that bit around the leg it's done a decent job of colorizing it you know it's obviously blurry and needs a touch up but it's not just a straight streak which I thought it would be uh, the eye has also been filled in pretty well I mean it's it's just as good as the, the opposite side even though it didn't really capture that data so yeah it's done quite a good job I mean this is it would be a close thing to try and do this much work this fast by hand and certainly if you wanted something that was accurate then I mean look at that it's just fast isn't it it's a, it's a really nice so I'm going to export it as an OBJ easier to work with in ZBrush and Maya and you can't open these files again so before you close off it just make sure that you definitely have saved an OBG, uh, OBJ and ping I've taken some really good scans um, and then forgotten to save them out properly so just just double check that so we want to import our croc scan into ZBrush and then once in ZBrush we can drag that out on screen and hit edit so we have our model in here we want to attach the textures so we want to go to texture and import and select the texture then select it in here and hit flip V now we can go to our sub tool and come down to texture map and in that texture map we can select that import so it'll come out really dark that's because it's showing the matte cap through but there is a flat color one here now this one's unwrapped and it's got this texture and there's all sorts of ways you can transfer that texture to a new low poly but for this we're going to actually bake this texture down into a poly paint file so this at the moment is 793 active points I'm going to subdivide this to give it some more detail on the surface and poly paint is going to color each one of these polys as if it was a pixel and to do that we want to put texture on go to poly paint and then we want to hit nRGB and then hit poly paint from texture which should project that texture down onto this mesh so now that's projected down and the texture is off so just to see the difference if we turn the texture on you can see that's pretty close to the detail that we've got there that'll do so now we should be able to sculpt this and make some changes without worrying about the UVs okay then so to start sculpting this we should dynamesh it so first of all let's duplicate this croc so that we don't lose the original and then on our new one let's go down to dynamesh so let's turn the resolution quite high set blur to zero make sure project is selected and also we want to delete the lower subdivisions if you've got any and then we can hit dynamesh so that's come out at nearly a million polys so let's have a look at the mesh yep that seems plenty to work with again duplicate this so now this is ready to be cleaned up so I'm going to duplicate the tail across blend that back in and do some other little cleanups on it and then that should be ready for the next stage
Okay, so we have our high poly asset completed. So now it's time to make the low poly. The absolute best way to make the low poly is to hand retopologize it, but that does take time. And if you're in a pinch and you're not doing like a portfolio perfect model, then there is other ways you can do it. The only reason you really want a perfect quadded model is if this is gonna be deformed in game. So if it's gonna be animatable, and as this is just a simple asset, we can kind of cheat and use some quick ways. Now, the two ways to do this in ZBrush is to use Z Remesher, which will automatically remesh this as neatly as possible. Or we can even use Decimation Master. That does require a little bit of cleanup at the end as well, but we'll get a very accurate result. So let's first of all have a go at Z Remesher. So on a duplicated model, we can first of all just turn off Poly Paint and let's put a Poly Mesh on. So in the geometry tab, we want to go down to Z Remesh. And if we just hit Z Remesh, we can have a look at the results without changing any of the settings. And places where Z Remesh kind of struggles is any thin surfaces or pointy edges. So this has done a pretty good job. As you can see, it's still very high poly, but it's it's kept the shape very well. Now, as we reduce the poly count on this, it's going to become more and more of a mess. So in Z Remesher, let's change this to 0.5 and hit Z Remesh again. Now let's try 0.1, which is pretty much its lowest setting. So you can see it's done its best, but it's really not done so well along the um, the thinner pointy bits. I don't think they will bake so well if we uh, just unhide the high poly. You can see there's quite a big difference between the high and low poly. The rest of it, like the back and the base, is pretty good. So let's just go back a step. Let's go for 0.3. And there's all sorts of things you can use, like Z Remeshing guides, and you can adjust these settings here for Z Remesh to get better results. So let's duplicate this and let's have another go. This time we're going to use Decimation Master. So in Z Plugin, we go down to Decimation Master and we want to pre process the current asset, the current tool. Once that's done, we can select a percentage of the current asset we want to reduce it to and hit decimate. So you can see that's reduced that quite a lot, but it's still quite dense. So let's go right down to 2%. Now you can see it's beginning to get lower poly. Let's try 0.5%. As you can see, Decimation Master does do a pretty good job of keeping the overall form. You know, we've lost the, the, the tips of the toes. However, I think this will probably do for my purposes. Um, nothing is going to be as good as if you were to retopologize this by hand and actually put the silhouette in place exactly where you want, want it. And also with Decimation Master, you do get very stretched polys. So it is worthwhile taking your Decimation Mesh into a program like Maya or Blender and just cleaning that up, getting rid of some of these odd shapes, like these long thin polys like that. You don't want this could just be one big quad here because we know it's a flat surface. Um, so you could have a much neater mesh. So I've just gone up one point in the decimation density because I noticed that the curve of the tail was missing. And the next step now is to export this low poly and unwrap it in a program like Maya or Blender. And we also want to export the high poly with the color so that we've got a high poly to bake that detail down onto our new unwrapped low poly. So I've got the low poly open in Maya and we can see it's 1,300 tries, which is what I would say way too high for your standard game prop. Like I say, there's no comparison to doing the topology of this by hand, but this is far faster for something inconsequential. Now you can also see though that decimation does some weird stuff like this. You've got this odd poly here that's a terrible shape. So it's things like that that you want to clean up. And we can do clean up like that by either deleting faces, welding faces, or cutting them. So I'm just gonna weld this. So we go to vertex mode. Just gonna weld that in there. And you could go around your model, just cleaning it up like that. Okay, so I've spent 10 minutes giving this a little bit of a clean up and you can see some areas are starting to look a lot better. And I've even managed to reduce it by a couple of hundred so you can see how spending a little bit longer on this would actually result in quite a nice mesh without having to go the traditional route of retopologization. So hopefully this shows you that there's more than one way to skin a, a crocodile, as it were. Now I'm gonna unwrap this and I think I'm just gonna chop the bottom off and have it mainly in two parts. So we'll see how that goes.
Okay, so once the UVs on this is done, we want to export it again, but before we do that, we should go to Mesh Display and soften those edges to get rid of all them hard edges because we don't want them baking into the model. We want to take that from the high poly. So we can export this now as the low poly. And the next step is to open up Substance Painter and put it all together. And this is the fun bit. This is where we get to see all the hard work uh, pay off. So getting the poly paint from the high poly to the low poly is normally quite tricky and involves subdivision in ZBrush, but I've discovered a little workaround that kind of speeds up the whole process and works pretty well as well. So what we want to do is go to File, New in Substance Painter, and we want to select PBR, that's the best for games, and we want to select our low poly, our new unwrapped low poly. So I'm going to set the document resolution to 4K because I like to have it as high as it'll possibly go for doing the painting, and then I can reduce it later for game. And I want to also hit Compute Tangent Space Per Fragment and nothing else ticked, so we can click OK. Now first of all, when you get your model in your scene, you just want to check your UVs, make sure that they're definitely on UV tile space zero. If you don't see anything there, they're probably not on the right tile space, they're off the tile space somewhere. Or you might have other issues like extra texture sets as well. Everything looks fine on this. No holes in the mesh, nothing like that no overlapping UVs, all seems okay. So let's transfer the color to this. So what we wanna do is go down to Bake Mesh Maps in Texture Set Settings, and this will open the new baking window. And we wanna to go to our High Definition Mesh and load in the High Poly. Now that OBJ should have the, each vertex also have an RGB color. So the color information is in this file. Uh, we want to change the frontal distance until pretty much all the red disappears, but we don't wanna to go too far because this will start to overlap and get some weird errors. So I'm gonna leave the rest of the settings as they are. And what I'm gonna do actually is turn everything off apart from ID. The ID is normally for making masks on a texture, but it does come with this option to do vertex color. And as we have a lot of vertex color information in that, we can actually use that to bake down the color into a map that we can then insert into the base color. So we just quick do a quick bake here to test it. You can see, bam, very quickly, We've got that color coming through there, it looks pretty perfect. So let's just go back to the common settings and this time I'm gonna ramp everything up to as high as it'll go, as high as what your, your PC can handle. And I'm gonna bake this again and it might take a bit longer this time. Okay then, so let's take a look at that. So if we go back to our painting mode, we can see that poly paint has come through there. Now this is, at the moment, this is the ID map. So if we go to the material, you'll see there's nothing there. But what we can do is if we put a fill in here and then turn off everything but color. We can go to our asset library and go to project and then deselect material. And you can see we've got the color map ID there. So if we just drag that and put it in the base color. Bam, we now have the poly paint information transferred across. So it's been a long road to get here, come through many iterations, but it is a pretty simple process. And now we have the scanned data in there. So it makes a really good base for us to layer a bit of extra dirt and stuff like that on top. So at the moment, it is still very shiny and simple. There's no details in this, so I'm just gonna hide this. Now let's bake down the high poly information. So we need to go back to the bake mesh maps. And this time, let's turn on normal, world space, normal, ambient occlusion, curvature, and position. So these settings all seem fine, so let's bake that detail down onto the croc. Now we can see we've got all our nice sculpted information on the croc there as well, so it's come out pretty well. There's some areas where you get a little bit of oddness where the mesh has just gone very very thin but generally that looks pretty good pretty neat so before we do anything else let's go back to our base color here and i'm just going to select base color in the view and the next step is just to clean up some of these artifacts within the base color you can do that by going to add a paint to that fill and then we can change the blending to pass through and then we want to come to clone stamp here and then holding v we can select an area that we want to use as the clone. And I'm gonna change the brush size down a little bit. We can start to carefully paint out some of these artifacts. So now let's add some roughness because if we go to the material, you can see it looks kind of shiny. And of course we can't scan a roughness map in, but we can kind of semi use the base color that we've got here to, to add a little bit of fakery to this. So let's add a fill and let's just turn everything off on that. Let's add a fill to this. 
and in this fill let's just select roughness and I'm going to drop this color map into the roughness channel here then we want to let's have a look at the roughness now with the roughness map the dark areas are going to be the least reflective and the lighter areas the most so we need to invert this above this fill here we can right click and add a levels and then in this levels we can change it to roughness and hit invert then we can clamp down on this a little bit let's have a look at that so if we go back to material so you can see the roughness map is way too dark so it's way too reflective so let's go back to roughness and just ramp this up that's looking more like it so let's add a little bit of extra detail this to this just to crispen it up a little so I'm going to add a new layer this is going to be a cavity to darken those cavities up a little bit I'm going to add a black mask to that add a generator and in that generator I'm going to add a curvature open up the curvature tab and change that to cavities then I'm going to do the same again but this time I'm going to add a bit of a highlight to the edges kind of polish the wood up a little bit and we want to add a black mask to that and a generator and um, we can use curvature again for this but this time we're going to leave it on the uh, edges and something I might add just to finish it all off is if we go to all libraries and filters grab a color correct and drop it on over the top of everything else and in this all we need to really do is change the saturation just a tiny amount on the shadows and the midtones just to make this color pop a little bit more and make it a little bit more rich and vibrant for a game scene so overall this is looking pretty good it's only taken about an hour maybe an hour and a half to take this this thing that sat on my desk and now I've got a fully textured game asset that's ready to go but the thing about this is there's so much more we can do with it we this might not just be a wooden toy in your game maybe we want this to be carved out of bone and we can just drag and drop a smart material straight onto this model and we've got a different look straight away or maybe you want this to look like it's been carved out of a pale marble or maybe a deep green highly polished marble it could be an old chipped metal painted toy that takes your fancy or how about an ancient bronze figurine but whatever you decide we can now export these textures so in the export settings there is a output template and there's many different options here whether you're using unity or ue5 but i'm going to set mine up in marmoset because it's fast and closely resembles a game engine and for that i'm just going to export them as the pbr metallic roughness setting so i'll show you just a short time lapse of my setup in marmoset and then we can take a look at the results So I hope this video was helpful and informative to you and if you enjoyed it and would like to see more please like and subscribe and I'll see you next time.